I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. I'm so glad you could be with us again for this week's episode of the Parenting Aces podcast. We are going to be talking community service and tennis this week. And y'all know how I feel about community service and giving back and tennis being involved in these types of projects. So I was so excited when I was contacted by the ITA about their new community service initiative, which is a year-long project that they have started this year. Uh, Actually, this month is the first month. It's the kickoff. And it's an initiative wherein college teams go out into their local communities, do something to benefit the community, then log those activities with the ITA, and the ITA is going to be recognizing those college tennis programs that are giving back in a significant way. And I think this is so brilliant on the part of the ITA because it's a way to engage the local communities in the college tennis program and hopefully build a bigger fan base for the team, um, get the team members' names out there, which will hopefully help them with jobs and networking as they begin to get ready to graduate and move into the next phase of their careers. And I just, I love this idea. And on top of that, TennisRecruiting.net is also launching a similar initiative for junior players. And again, what better way to get your name out into your community than by doing good works and giving back? And so I'm so excited to have Mary Edmond with the ITA and Rhiannon Potkey with TRN on this week's show to talk about those initiatives the impetus behind developing them, and what they're hoping will come out of encouraging these young players, college and juniors, to give back. So without further ado, let me bring on Mary, and you'll hear from Rhiannon as well, and sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode. Mary Edmond of the ITA, thank you so much for joining us on the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm just so excited to chat with you about the ITA's Community Service Month. Thanks for having me. So let's jump right in here, and I'd love for you to give my listeners a little bit of background on your involvement in tennis and how you came to have this position with the ITA. Uh, Sure. So I've been playing tennis my entire life. Um, Started when I was four in Colorado and then played USTAs in NorCal, played high school tennis in Northern California, um, and played college tennis at Colorado College, which is a Division III school in Colorado Springs. Um, Loved my four years there. And when I graduated, I received the tremendous opportunity to work for the United States Olympic Committee, which happened to be based out of Colorado Springs. And about eight months in, saw the opportunity to apply for the ITA and jumped on it, thought, you know, college tennis was something that I had always loved and, you know, loved playing it and miss it. And so it just seemed like the perfect opportunity to get back in. And I was lucky enough to get the job. Well, that's fantastic. I love giving our listeners a little bit of information on how different people get involved in the tennis industry and and the different jobs that are available out there after college tennis. I think it's really important to have a clear understanding of, you know, what happens to a player that's not maybe going to go on and play professional tennis, but how they parlay their college tennis experience into a profession after they graduate. So I I love that you're working for the ITA and um, we're all very lucky to have you still involved in, in tennis. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, you know, I never really thought that there was a path in college tennis. I just never, I never connected the ITA with a job opportunity. And so I couldn't ask to be anywhere else right now. (laughs) That's great. And so now you are director of community programs for the ITA. What does that mean? What does your job entail? Uh, Anything that has to do with ITA membership runs through me. So big programs are our spring awards programs, All-Americans, academic awards. Those are, you know, the spring is heavy with awards. 
Um, and then in the fall, it's renewal of memberships is, you know, obviously a major one. And then we've started last year running these coaching education webinars, um, just giving a chance for coaches to talk to other industry experts and kind of grow themselves. And those have been really exciting. Um, they've been very popular. They're all, you know, if you're a member, they're free for you. We save all the recordings, so they're available on our website. So I think that has become a big um, opportunity within our membership. So really, I'm just kind of trying to work with what do we provide our members? What can we provide? You know, trying to grow the benefits that coaches receive because we don't want coaches to feel like they're not getting what they need out of their membership with the ITA. Right. And the ITA, just to be clear, is an organization for college tennis coaches, but you guys do a lot for the players. You do a lot for the fans and the parents. And and I want to just put it out there that for my listeners, you know, if you're not following the ITA on social media, if you're not checking their website, you're really missing out on some great information. Yeah, I think, you know, I think people kind of miss that, that we are, you know, a college, a tennis coaches association, but, you know, we do more than just work with coaches. We host events for the players. We're trying to create, you know, make these events a place that the players want to be. Um, we do the summer circuit, which is obviously big with our junior and college players. And then the awards, the awards are for the players, you know, the coaches will submit them, but at the end of the day, you know, if the players, you know, want those academic awards, they want to earn those awards. So those are all for those kids. So this year, for the first time, you're doing Community Service Month, and it's going on right now through the, throughout the month of October. Give us a little bit of background on Community Service Month, why you all decided to do this, and what you're seeing out there in terms of the participating teams. Tim Russell, our CEO, kind of had a meeting with um, Erica Perkins, Jasper, and I and kind of expressed that he wanted to focus on community service. We all know that our teams do so much within their towns and their communities, and he thought that we needed a way to showcase that. Um, Erica and my coworker, Nicola Duca, and I kind of took that and ran with it. We decided that the best way for our staff and to focus on the community service month, it was just to narrow it down to a month, you know, a season is really long and with so much going on with teams, it could kind of get lost. And so we felt like if we just promoted it as a singular month, the info we get from schools would be awesome. And then it would just be a reoccurring thing that you would consistently see on our social media. So it would be out there publicly all the time. Uh, and we settled on October uh, due to scheduling. We know small colleges have a different schedule than Division One, and we wanted to make sure that any and every school could participate, regardless of their division. Um, so even though October is obviously difficult for our staff, and it's also difficult for Division One schools sometimes, we, we thought that this was the best way to get the most teams involved. And we've really seen, you know, we're in our second weekend, and we already have um, over 20 submissions. We're almost at 30 teams who've submitted. Um, we have teams, you know, the team that's done the most hours has done uh, about 40 some hours, which is just incredible that they've done this just in the month of October. And, you know, the, wow. the events that they do range. Um, we have a bunch of play days uh, with partnering with a middle school in the area or just hosting one on their campus. Um, Aces for Autism has been popular, and then I've seen, you know, a couple schools doing cleanups, um, some people doing hurricane relief, which I just think is so timely and great, but it, it's, they've ranged all over the place, and I think that that's what's so cool about this month is it's really cool to see what teams do in their community. So explain to us how this works in terms of teams, you know, planning of an event and then reporting that to you guys and then what you do with the information once you get it. So once the team has done the event, we have a Google form that is available um, on our website. So, you know, if you're a coach and want to submit an SID, a player, you know, we kind of we're not we're leaving that open to whoever wants to submit. Um, we take that information and we are using it to update this Lehman Era Hours Challenge. It's available on our website. So this is our tracker that Nicole um, on our staff has worked, um, done amazing work with. And we're pretty much taking the hours that teams have done and we're building like a bar graph. We separate it by men and women, by division, and we're putting in teams logos. And then the size of the logo box is based on the amount of hours that the teams have done. 
And we just think it's a fun, interactive way for teams to kind of be like, oh, like we see ourselves on here. They also can see what other schools are doing. We just thought it would be a fun way to bring, you know, and make it a little more interactive, but make it a little bit competitive. Um, and at the top of that, you know, we're tracking the number of teams who've participated, the number of student athletes, um, the teams with the most hours as of right now, and then, you know, the number of men or women participating. And we just thought that this would be a fun way for people to, you know, you can check it um, pretty much almost every night. Uh, Nicole or I will be updating it. And so it's going to be a live tracker. And we just thought it was like a fun way to make it so interactive and, you know, data would consistent be consistent with what we've received. So no, so teams would see themselves, you know, the day after they've submitted their information to us. That's great. And just for my listeners, we'll have a link to that in the show notes so you can check it out and see exactly what Mary's talking about. And so you guys, you get this information, you put it up on the website, and at the end of the month, what happens? So at the end of the month, we have three prizes that are going to be available for schools. So the first one being um, the biggest one, which is a $1,000 grant to, um, to the program, and that's for the team that has done the most combined hours over the entire month. So if you are doing an event every Saturday, we'll pull all that information and um, add up all your hours. And so whatever team has the most will receive an $1,000 grant. And along with that, the coach will receive a free 2018 coaches, IKEA coaches convention registration. We know that, you know, the money is going to go to the program and that's amazing, but we also know how tirelessly these coaches could be working on these events and helping plan them and everything. And we kind of wanted to give them a reward, but we also wanted to say, you know, this is a big deal to us. You know, we really we want it to benefit the student athletes, but we want to benefit the coaches too, because at the end of the day, we are a coaches organization and, you know, we want to recognize those coaches that are doing amazing things out in their community and with their team. So that is with the Luminar Hours Challenge. So when you see that tracker, the team that has the most hours, and if that's constantly changing, whoever ends up there at the end of October, the, that will be the team receiving the $1,000 grant. Um, we also have two other prizes, which are $500 grants, which, you know, are just as amazing. One of them will be to the team that creates the most buzz on Indie.com. Uh, Indie.com is a new system that we're trying their social media platform. And teams will just submit their photo or their video onto that page. They'll receive a link that they need to just share out that link. And how many number of clicks they get on that link, that's now generating buzz. And by at the end, Indie.com is tracking all of that information for us and whoever is the most um, buzz, they'll give that information to us, and the, that program will receive $500, and that coach as well will receive um, a 2018 free uh, coaches convention registration. And then our last one is we really wanted to say, hey, doing this is a you know great, and so any team that completes more than 20 hours will be put into a random drawing, and one team will just get pulled out of a hat and receive $500. We just thought, you know, it's great when you do the most, and then the Indie.com, it's great if you get a lot of buzz, but also doing 20 hours in the month of October is an incredible feat. And we thought that we wanted to give everyone that does that um, an equal chance to receive a, a grant for their program. Um, so those are like what we'll be doing at the end. And along with that, we'll be taking all the information that we've received from coaches and we'll be putting together a little recap video, um, just celebrating the month and what everyone has done. And it'll have, you know, like the total number of hours that IPA programs have completed, like, it'll include all these amazing stats, and I think it's going to be really cool to see what those numbers are at the end of the month. Yeah, I, I love this. And I my listeners know I am a huge proponent of giving back to the community, and I, I just I love that y'all are doing this. And this is all kind of part and parcel of a bigger effort with the ITA. Y'all give out a community service award at the end of the year as part of your bigger awards program. And I'm proud to say the team that my son played for last year won that award and it was really exciting. And the team was so proud and the coach was so proud. And, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about how this fits into the ITA's kind of larger um, mindset around giving back to the community? That award, you know, came about because we have all these amazing spring awards, you know, senior player of the year, rookie of the year. And we felt like 
other than the Arthur Ashe Award, all of those awards are so player-based and on your athletic accomplishments, which we don't want to minimize. I mean, that's always incredible. But we also felt like there's, you know, we have 1,200 member schools. And of those 1,200 schools, there's like a great amount of those that, you know, aren't getting those awards from year to year. And so the award kind of came about because we know that those are the schools that really are doing some incredible things out in their community. And we thought, you know, we really should reward them for that, you know, that we don't want to diminish. We don't want to be so focused on the results that we forget what other teams are doing. And so this award kind of came out of that. And then from there, we built this month from there. And so what we started with is we knew that these teams had submitted for the month. So we emailed those coaches and said, hey, we know that you guys are already doing events in your community. We're doing this month. We'd love for you guys to be leaders in it. And a lot of them were like, yeah, totally. We're always doing things like this is what we're doing. We'll submit it. And so we kind of use that award as like the stepping stone to this month. And can you talk a little bit about what that year end award means to these programs, you know, that that they're being recognized for something outside of their tennis results? You know, I can't, you know, I received multiple emails from coaches who received these and the amount of hours that I've seen submitted, you know, have been truly amazing. And I think for those schools, it's just, you know, any amount of recognition that from anyone that they're doing something incredible, that's what the coaches want. And I think that that's what this award gives. You know, we, we did choose regional and national winners. And I think, you know, go, moving forward, we're going to rethink that because there is no winner or loser in terms of community service. And we want everyone to get recognized. There are teams that do, you know, East Carolina University Women's Tennis did over 500 hours of service last year. And that's an absolutely incredible oh. feat. And, you know, no other teams, I think, got near that number that were submitted. But that doesn't mean that if you're out there doing, you know, 50 hours, that's, you know, that's a great thing too. So, you know, I think just getting recognition for what they're doing in the community, that's what mattered most to those coaches. And I think the players felt the same way. It's just, it's, you know, you want to be recognized. You want people to notice what hard work you're doing and what important work you're doing. And besides that, there are so many benefits to having the teams participate in their communities. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're hearing from the coaches. And I don't know if you hear from the players too, but you can speak to your own experience as a former college player about what you get out of doing this type of work. I think as a player, the biggest thing you just get is kind of life experience. You know, you're, this is your opportunity to plan an event, run an event, you know, do the coordination. And those are all skills that you're going to need in life when you get a job or, you know, whatever you do. Um, those are just true life skills, but also you're building relationships in your community. So if you're a freshman, you're going to have four more years spent in that community. And so you want a solid foundation. You want it to feel like home, you're home away from home. And so by doing events in your community, you're building that foundation. You're, you know, you're meeting people that hopefully will show, you know, they'll come to your matches and they'll just forever for the next four years be a part of your life. And I think that that's the most valuable thing that uh, student athletes can learn from it. And it's the unique opportunity that a student athlete, you know, gets to have. Athletes are always, you know, communities are so tied to their school. They always care about their school. And the biggest way they show how is showing up to football game, basketball game, baseball, tennis. So by building that relationship, you know, you're just ingraining yourself into that community. Um, you're going to get recognized and the community is going to love you for it because any team that's giving back, I think is important and your community members will recognize that. And hopefully it translates into them coming out to support the team as well. Yeah. I, I think that's the hope is, you know, you build a fan base unintentionally, you know, you're trying to do great things, but from there you build a you know, a fan base. And when we did it, um, the ITA partnered with uh, ASU on an event to do kind of a little kickoff to this month. And um, Matt Hill and Sheila McInerney had printed out posters with their home match schedule. And at the end of the day, they were handing out those posters. They were saying, you know, go get autographs from the players. They'll sign the posters. But even so, you know, those kids were taking home the posters with match dates. And so families just hanging at home and looked at that calendar. It's like, oh, we're not doing anything. Let's go to that match you're just, you know, that's an easy way to just try to get people interested in what you're you're doing. One of the challenges with college tennis, especially in recent years, has been getting people out to the matches, but also preserving the programs. We've seen a lot of programs cut, and I know this is, 
you know, an initiative that the ITA is working on as well. And can you talk a little bit about how these community service efforts can can help toward that effort of, of making sure these programs are viable? Sure. Something that I was, you know, tasked to work with when I started here was the DROP program um, protocol that we've kind of created over the past few years. It's become, a, you know, a more noticeable problem than it has in the past. And something that Eric and I have talked about with our experience level is that when you're involved in the community, it makes you invaluable to your athletic department, to your community, to your fans. Um, and it's something that I think it's an, not an easy thing, but it's a doable thing that any team can go out and do. It doesn't take money. It doesn't, you know, all it takes is your time and energy to get out there and get involved. And so we thought that this was a mark that sometimes coaches do miss and they don't realize this is like an e you know, a thing that you can easily go do and you can task your team to go do. Um, and we just thought that this, you know, by encouraging teams to be a part of this month and even, you know, by us showing what teams are doing this month, maybe, you know, we'll promote a team that their AD is like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize my team was doing this. This is awesome. Like, and so we think that it's just an, a thing that people, everyone should be doing, every team should be doing. And we know, I'd say like 99% of teams probably do, but now we're going to like showcase it and focus on it for a month. And what will you do with the information after the month is over? Will you guys continue to showcase these schools or, you know, how will you use their, their good work? I think it's something that we plan on showcasing. Well, you know, when tournament season slows down and we have time, I think, you know, Nicole and I will sit down and go through what we received and look through the photos and, I think we'll do something with them. You know, we want to collect this information for it to be used and we want to promote teams that are doing things. So if teams are still working on projects later in the year, if we see that we can promote it and be like, you know, Hey, like throw back to when they did this in October, look at them still doing it now. And that just makes it the message about community service all the more powerful. Um, but I think, you know, we will want to do something with this data and we just need to sit down and kind of go through all of it and figure out what's the best way to, use all of it and, you know, make it the best that it can be. And you mentioned to me off air something about a video that you guys are going to be putting together. Yeah. So Nicole is going to make um, a recap video at the end of the month. Um, we'll track kind of all the numbers that are coming in and we're going to pull those numbers that we find interesting and kind of go through, you know, maybe what division has the most hours, you know, total hours done by ICA members and, She'll make, um, we'll use the photos that we received and she'll make a little highlight video of the month. And I think it'll be really cool to see what's been done because I think it's special what we're doing. I think it's unique and it needs, you know, and I think the numbers are going to be pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I, I mean, I love this whole idea and, you know, the idea of getting these student athletes out in their communities because let's face it, the majority of them are not going on to professional tennis careers. They're going to be getting a job doing something other than playing tennis. And so to be able to get out in the community and maybe meet some community leaders and make those connections and network, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Yeah, I think it just teaches, you know, it's a little, it's a, it's a growing up lesson for the players and there's a lot that goes into these kind of events. And so I think it's just, you know, it's that much more important for kids to learn that you're more than just your team. Your community is just as important to the functionality of your team. Right. And what do you see happening with community service, excuse me, community service month moving forward after 2017? I think we'd love to continue it. I, you know, I think it's, it's more of a matter of, you know, we'll take in advice that we receive from coaches in terms of what months work for best for them, what don't, and we'll see what path we need to take. I think as a staff and Tim is very passionate about community service, so it will continue. It just might change, but we haven't, we'll have to sit down and kind of review and see, could we have gotten more submissions if we did this, or do we need to switch months? Um, that's something that we'll discuss, but I think our staff as a whole would just love to see that this grow and become a big thing and become recognized that's like, hey, it's October, what are we doing? You know, what events are happening? And teams are just ready to go with it. 
Right. I think it's it's just unbelievable. And I know this is a busy time of year for you guys. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the events that the ITA is currently involved in putting on this month and what's coming up so that the tennis fans out there can hopefully get to some of these events. Sure. So right now, well, today right now is uh, the men's ITA men's all American final. Um, they're streaming. Streaming is available for those matches on um, the men's final happening right now. Uh, women's all American final was yesterday. So it's been a busy, you know, two weeks. Those are really big tournaments. They take a lot of time and energy, but those are about to conclude. And then starting on Wednesday, we have our ITA Oracle cup. It's, you know, other than ITA regionals, it's our one small college event that we run. And it's the winners from all those regional tournaments. Um, come will be in Rome, Georgia, and they'll meet and they'll play it out. And the winner of those from each division will receive an automatic entry into our national fall championship. So it's the, really the, the national fall championship is the one time a year that small college players can, you know, play some division one guys. And I think that's the really unique aspect. And this year that draw is going to be bigger. So now instead of having an Oracle cup, winner go all four small college divisions will be represented at the fall championship which is just cool i think and when when is the fall championship and where is that the fall championship will be in palm springs and it's that last week of october uh running from i believe tuesday to that sunday so it's not only a busy time for you guys but it's a super busy time for the student athletes and the coaches as well because they're traveling here, here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, it makes it, you know, it's a unique challenge with this month. And a lot of coaches have been like, well, we did something at the very end of September. We have tournaments all October. Does that count? And for us, it's, you know, we don't want to exclude anyone. So we're taking projects that were done September 29th and 30th and taking them because we understand that for certain schools, this is tournament time. This is your individual tournaments. These are dates that you need. And so we don't want to exclude anyone from the month. And it's a unique challenge, I think, for coaches to now have to navigate putting this into all the matches that they also play as a team and not overwhelming their student athletes when it's, you know, maybe the second month of school. Right. <laughs> because, I mean, they got to go to class and write papers and take tests too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, the event this week in Rome, Georgia, I just want to say I will be there hopefully on Friday. And it looks like our weather is going to cooperate for you guys. It's rainy and gross today, but the weather system moves yeah. out. So um, it's <laughs> going to be, I think it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a little hot and humid. So I just a heads up. Yeah, yeah. We've been following Corey Brooks, our director of championships, been following that weather pattern and crossing our fingers and hoping, you know, we get some at least sunshine, but we'll take clouds and no rain at this point. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So getting back to Community Service Month, I just want to make sure that the listeners hear from you the best way to find out what teams are doing. So um, what advice do you have for my listeners who might want to participate in some of these events or, you know, get out to see them? I think the best way is, you know, following your local teams, uh, their social media. I think, you know, if they're doing play days on campus and things open to children, they'll promote it through their social media. They'll promote it through the email list they have. So if you're playing at a local club, you know, making sure that, you know, those coaches are receiving that information. But even with it, like if you see that your team, check out their schedule, that they have an invitational in town, go to those matches. And, you know, coaches love seeing fans out there and, you know, they'll, they'll make notice of that. And then if you get the chance, you know, talk to them and see if they're doing something this month or in general, even over the course of the year. But I think, you know, following your team, your local team, social media will be the strongest, the best way of knowing what's going on. Great. And I want to just say too, that, you know, most of the teams have websites now, most of them have Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, and so it's really easy to get that information. There's really no excuse. And please, please, please go out and support your teams. Um, go out to their matches. Take your kids out. Uh, make sure your kids get to meet the players at the matches. The, the college players, they love having fans. I mean, it makes them, you know, feel really good to know that people are out supporting them. And, and so I want to encourage the parents out there to please do that. Please get out and to the matches, make sure your kids, 
meet the players and and if they're ball kid opportunities at your local colleges take your kids out for the ball kid tryouts and and get them involved that way too there's just there's always a lot going on in college tennis right mary there always is it's always you know, full year year-round sports what makes it special Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your Community Service Month with us. And I want to just let my listeners know again that the link to all of the the websites that Mary mentioned will be in the show notes. And Mary, if anybody has any questions, how can they get to you? Um, there, feel free to email me. My email is uh, medman at itatennis.com. If they have questions, if I need to direct them to, you know, school, if they're interested in what's going on, I can kind of, I can see if I have anything in my inbox in terms of information. But yeah, feel free to email me with any questions that you want. Fantastic. Well, thanks again so much for being with us. And I'm looking forward to following the progress and hopefully meeting you in Rome this weekend. Sounds awesome. Rhiannon Potkey of TennisRecruiting.net is with us now, and I'm so happy to have the chance to chat with her because while we have exchanged emails and traded social media communications, we've never actually talked. So, Rhiannon, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's always uh, it's always funny in this world now. We we tend to communicate so much and you know, never really actually talk. So I really enjoy the fact that we can actually talk because I think sometimes stuff uh, gets lost in just exchanging emails. It's very convenient, but it's always better to kind of talk. I agree. I agree. So let's start by having you tell my audience how you got involved in tennis. Okay. Well, um, I played tennis as a junior. I I grew up in Southern California. um, So I, I played I guess I must have started when I was about seven. My brother was a player as well and um, actually grew up playing at Cabrillo Racquet Club with Mike and Bob Bryan. They were, their dad, Wayne, was the uh, director out there. And I actually, their mom was my coach for many years. So grew up in uh, Southern California, which was, if you're a tennis player, that was ideal. It was really fun. Um, So played till I was about, I want to say 15, um, but I was a four sport athlete. So Eventually, you know, basketball was kind of my passion. I was really loved softball and soccer. So I was probably mentally healthier as a team sport person. Let me just put it that way. Um, I, I loved having <laughs> a team around me. I was a really good doubles player, but uh, singles kind of got in my head, my own head a little bit too much. So it was healthier for me to kind of stick with team sports. Um, but then I just, you know, once I graduated, I went to UC Santa Barbara um, and I was a journalism. I was already working in a newspaper. And so kept through kept into tennis by covering it a lot you know I covered a lot of really good juniors out in SoCal like you know the Bryans I mentioned Sam Query uh, just a whole you know Marco Ciron so a lot of really good juniors and talent Steve Johnson um, covered the Pac-12 championships for 15 or 16 years up in Ojai um, so covered a lot of Davis Cup matches and just uh, have kept writing about it through the years it wasn't something that I specifically wrote about I was I, I was a newspaper journalist for 20 years so I wrote covered a lot of football, basketball, baseball, soccer. I'm I'm a sports junkie. But tennis has always been something that I've kept on my radar and written about a lot. And my brother's still very involved in it. He's the uh, executive director at USDA Georgia. So um, tennis is always going to, you know, has been a part of my life, will always be a part of my life, and, and always enjoyed writing about it, even when it wasn't something that I was specifically focused on. That's so funny. Darren and I know each other well, um, and uh, yeah, we love having him here. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's a, you know, I have to say it's nice to have when people in tennis recognize my name, it's nice that usually they like Darren, which is always advantageous. So that, (laughs) and for good reason. I mean, the guy is one of the hardest workers I've ever met and just uh, completely I mean, I, I, I'm a little biased, but honestly, his brain and what he can do for tennis is, to me, just amazing. And I'm, I kind of marvel at him. I mean, I laugh, you know, just because I, I know how much time he puts into it. But it, it's good that he's also just a really good person. <laughs> well, I'm glad that his sister likes him. That's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is good. Your parents did, did well to uh, foster that. So um, now you're working for TRN, and I see your byline on a lot of articles there. And um, so you've 
you've really kind of thrown yourself back into the junior tennis world and the world of college recruiting, which we're thrilled to have you. And recently, you and TRN announced a new initiative called First Serve for Community. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and where it came from? Yeah, that yeah, it's it is uh it's something that I you know, I'm journalism is my, my passion. I really love writing, obviously that's my job and I love it, but really what I really um am passionate about is helping other people. I kinda left the newspaper industry partly to start a nonprofit that I'm still working on. Um and the hours covering I was covering Tennessee football. So the hours on a football beat in the SEC are not conducive to having much of a life outside of that, which uh you know, and I was if I'm doing something, I'm 100%. So uh, it was all consumed, and I kind of got to a point in my life where I was saying, you know, I really just feel like I want to help the community better. Like, I just feel like there's a, there's a passion in me that wants to help others. So part of the move to TRN was so I could do TRN stuff and really do my own, can kind of set my own schedule, work really hard, but then have time to kind of try to help the community through nonprofit ways and volunteering. And so this kind of combined my two passions. When I saw the – I knew the ITA had done this. Um, talked to a lot of coaches about what their teams have been doing and I said you know what why can't juniors do this like they can and I see a lot of high school teams going volunteering places um, for all sports I see a lot of you know once you get to the college level it's it's really emphasized I mean there's you know there's team community service efforts in almost every sport basketball football does a lot so I you know I thought you know why can't tennis do it like there's a lot of a lot of opportunity for kids to start now um, and it and I just I just wanted to throw it out there and see. I figured, you know, if, if only if you do it, that's better than none, right? Like, I don't know how many are going to take me up on this. I don't know how many are going to send us information saying they've done it. But I feel like, you know what, if, if even three or four people can make a difference in the world that weren't before that, that's great. And, it, they're, you know, it's just it gives me a platform to do this. And I think a lot of kids, when they get to college, they're going to do it anyway. So why not start now and start that kind of mindset? Um, tennis is a very – it has to be kind of an inherently selfish sport because it's individual. You're working a lot of time on the court. So I feel like if there's a way that you can kind of step outside yourself and kind of see the bigger picture in life, um, why not try to do it? So if, if this can help maybe get some kids to do that, that's great. You know, I really have no set goals or set expectations. As you can see, I made it very open-ended. I said you can do it any month, any day of the year. You can do it. It could be like an hour. It could be a day. I really wanted it to be something that if they want to do it, it's not restricted. Um, I didn't want to, you know, restrict it to a month because I know kids' schedules are crazy. So I'm um, hoping someone will take me up on it. I don't know if they will, but, you know, you can't can't know until you try, right? Absolutely. And so you, you wrote an article that got posted on TRN, and we'll have a link to that in the podcast show notes. Um, I tweeted out the article and posted it on our Facebook page. So hopefully my listeners are already – somewhat familiar with what you're doing, but um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how TRN is going to handle any submissions that it gets, or maybe you don't know yet. Maybe this is a work in progress. Yeah, it's a, my, my, I wanted, like I said, I wanted to kind of start really, you know, kind of small. I don't want to make any promises. I don't want anyone to have to promise us anything. I don't want you to submit like our sheets of things to do. So I figured, you know, social media is always a good way to kind of, you know, we, to show what people are doing. So if if they send me something by email, it's Rhiannon at tennisrecruiting.net, and you show me what you did and, and you have a photo or you tell me where you did it, we can share it on all our social media outlets like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and then, you know, I might combine a few at some point throughout the year and just do a short story with some of the pictures included to kind of uh, like a wrap-up of like, here's what's happened the last few months or weeks. Um, so that's kind of my initial starting point. It could morph into something bigger. I just don't want to put it out there right away and then, you know, have nothing. You know, I, I I wanted to kind of just let people, I wanted to kind of grow organically and see what I get and then see how I can use that from there. But initially to start, my goal is just to kind of post some of the stuff on social media and let people know, hey, you know, this team or this person did this this week or, you know, something of that nature. So, you know, you, you don't do, you know, you're not you don't do community service to get kudos that's not really what you're supposed to be doing you know like some people i remember always i always laugh because you know i'm just doing it to put it on my college resume i said well that kind of defeats the purpose of i was glad people were doing it but you know it really wasn't the altruistic means 
So I didn't want to like be like, hey, we're going to reward, you know, you're going to get a big trophy if you do this. I wanted it to be something that they really want to do um, and out of the goodness of their heart. So I didn't want to, you know, make it like a contest. So that's kind of why I kept it pretty open-ended and kind of kept it just to maybe just, you know, give them a little bit of credit on social media. But, um, you know, like I said, not make it to where it's going to be something that they feel like, oh, I got to do this to win per se. Right. So if if a young player comes to you, reaches out to you and says, hey, I I love this idea. I really want to do something, but I have no idea where to start. Can you offer up some resources or point them in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I'm more than happy to. I mean, I, you know, it's I, I would have to obviously be where they are, you know, where they're where they're living, you know, certain areas. There's a lot of people that volunteer, like at food banks or boys and girls clubs, or even just teaching tennis to a neighbor, to be honest. Like, I'm not making it, you know, even mowing the neighbor's grass or helping, you know, a neighbor go shopping. I mean, I really don't want it to be like, you know, you have to go to an organization. I just want it to really be about helping other people. Like, step outside your own head for a minute and, you know, be good to your neighbor or help this person. It can be really small. I mean, I really don't want it to have to be like, you got to go and get like a sheet signed by the director at the food bank. Um, but yeah, if people want to reach out to me, I'm more than happy to do some research to figure out close to them what might be feasible. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm really, really passionate about this in my own life. Um, and I just feel like, especially this day and age right now, we could use a lot of that. Um, so I'm more than willing to take some time out of my own day and, and do some research and give them some options if, if they really don't know what they want to do. Um, you know, right. and there's, there's tons of things people can do on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be something that's super organized. Like I said, I don't want it. I don't want to make this hard. I want to make it easy and I just want to make it about helping. I love that message. You know, it, you said that you want people to do this because it's, it's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do is you know, being part of a community, we should give back. I mean, that's just being human and and living in a society. But there are some real perks that come from doing community service outside of resume value. And it seems to me that you obviously live that and recognize that. Can you talk a little bit about personally the benefits that you felt as a result of giving back to your own communities? For sure. Yeah. To me that it, there's no other feeling like it. I, I don't, I really, I mean, maybe it's an individual, I think for me, but just seeing other people, bringing joy to other people, helping other people to me, I really have never felt anything like, I mean, I participated in sports. I've won championships. Nothing gives me the greater satisfaction than that. And I, like I said, it might be individualized, but I really do feel like if someone does it, they'll kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, it's just, you know, just the idea that, you know, you that you can bring a smile to someone's face on it, you know, that maybe was struggling. And it, it's the littlest things in life. You get a lot of value out of it. I've, you know, I've learned empathy through it. I've seen, I've been able to kind of get a new, you, you get a new perspective sometimes. Like you would never interact with some people that you interact with through these things and you learn their story and you think, huh. I never thought about it that way or I never knew that people live like this or I didn't, you know, so so then when you see things later on, you're not as quick to judge, maybe you're not as judgmental. You're not as like you see someone and you kind of make a stereotypical statement. Um, you tend to learn a little bit more about other people and diversity. And the diversity part is huge. I mean, you know, you meet people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. You meet people that are just, you know, maybe are struggling, but like are really good people, but you maybe would have never crossed paths with them in, in, until you volunteered. Um, it's really easy to say stuff until you put yourself in someone else's shoes. And this kind of gives you an idea, like how it is to be, you know, in some people's, you know, if, especially if you're volunteering at like food banks or volunteering with like underprivileged children, um, you know, you just kind of get a a little window that maybe you wouldn't have gotten before. And I really believe it does teach empathy. Um, and it's something that we kind of, you know, that, that I think, especially with the tennis world, I mean, we're not, you know, I'm not being stereotypical here, but you know, most tend to be upper middle class, right? You know, you got to have a little money to play tennis, obviously with the travel and everything. And so I think that's why I think tennis can be impacted by this even more because you might be, you might never, you might never converse or interact with people like that as much because you, you know, some of those other sports tend to have kids that maybe come from a a poor background that are teammates with tennis. It's it's Mm -hmm. usually, it's, it's rarely the case. So this maybe can open that door a little bit more. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I I have no science to back up this statement that I'm about to make, but I suspect that, you know, by giving to others, sometimes maybe it can help you put things like a bad day on the tennis court in perspective and not get so wigged out when you double fault too many times or you lose a match that you should have won or you just basically have a bad practice or, you know, you have a conflict on the tennis court. By putting yourself out there and giving to others, hopefully it helps put all of that in, into perspective and, and helps these kids maybe find a little bit more balance mentally when they do go out on the court to compete. For sure. I definitely, I definitely think that's the case. I mean, using a really recent example in a different sport, but last night, if, if anyone's an NFL fan, J.J. Watt broke his leg, right? I mean, he's the guy that, you know, with one tweet raised $37 million for a hurricane relief when he was only hoping to raise, you know, a couple hundred thousand maybe. Um, you know, I have to think, though, that, you know, he now, I mean, when you're injured or something like that, his purpose, he realizes that his purpose in life can be just greater than that. Like, it's not the end-all be. I mean, it's not – he obviously is very disappointed and very sad, but I have to admit, I have to think that some of what he's done off the side with his foundation and stuff puts it into perspective. It makes him realize he can still help people. He can still have a purpose in life beyond athletics, you know? Um, And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up and I was the way when I was a kid, I mean, I was such a competitive person that, you know, I needed some of that to kind of just like, Hey, it's not, I mean, it seems like the be all end all and I'm very, you know, you want to win and you want to be great, but you know, you need a life outside because it could end quick, you know, and you need to see that there's other things and there's other people that are worse off and it's losing a match. Isn't quite as bad as, you know, not knowing if you're going to eat tomorrow, you know, it, it, it sounds really kind of cliche ish, but it is really true. So I do believe that you're right on there. I do believe that there's something to be said, like, Hey, you know, I lost that match, but Hey, you know what? Like I can go help someone else or I can, you can find value in other areas of your life. And, and I really think that meant I was a psychology major in college so part of that stems from this, too. There is a component of that that I do think you're right on with that. And I bet if they did do a scientific study that, that you probably would prove accurate on that as well. Well, I like to think so. <laughs> yeah, I'll just give you credit. Yeah. We can, you can write a journal article okay. just by it, you know. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So for juniors that want to get involved in First Serve for Community, what is the first step that they need to take? Uh, basically just find something to do and do it. That's the first step. Or like you said, if you can't think of something, contact me. Um, but just find something in your community, like, you know, find something around your neighborhood that you want to do that, that helps others. I mean, I really, the, the definition is really broad. Just help other people somehow. I mean, at this point, I, you know, I'm keeping it pretty open-ended. And then once you do, I mean, take a photo of it, take some sort of, you know, I mean, it, it just do something to kind of chronicle that you did it, you know, give me a little bit of basic information, and then you can email me with, with all that information or reach me out on, uh, reach us on Twitter, our Twitter handle. But if you want to email me, it's Rhiannon, which is R-H-I-A-N-N-O-N at tennisrecruiting.com. Uh, just let me know. Let me know what you did, where you did it. And, you know, like I said, a photo would be great. Now we've got phones. Everyone can take photos and videos. Uh, much better than when I was a kid and you had to go get it developed and send it through the mail. So uh, you can do that and, and, and we'll, you know, figure out a way, like I said, we'll share it on social media and may even end up doing a story about it. Maybe call you for a story if it's really great stuff. And and even if it's not, we'll include you in a story somehow down the line. So it's really, like I said, I really want it to be more about just doing things and, you know, and and if you want to let us know, great. If you do stuff you don't want to let us know, that's fine too. If you're a pretty private person, if this inspires you and you just don't want any credit, more power to you. But if you do want to let us know, we're happy to, to kind of share it with the audience and share it with everyone. And maybe hopefully through that, inspire others to start. Fantastic. Well, I love this, Rhiannon, and I'm so happy that you were able to spend some time with us today to talk a little bit more about your great initiative and I'm hoping that my audience jumps all over this and gets their kids involved. And uh, thank you again for taking the initiative here. Yeah, well, thank you for having this. This is a great podcast. I'm sure I I know your listeners already know that. Hopefully we can spread the word more. It's it's really great. And thank you for doing something like this and having us on, because the more we can get the word out, the better. Um, And hopefully some of your listeners will take that initiative and they can, like I said, reach out to me anytime with any other questions they might have. 
Great. Thanks again, Rhiannon. And to my listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Parenting Aces. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the Parenting Aces podcast. And if you are so inclined, we'd love for you to leave a review for us on iTunes. And be sure to subscribe to the Parenting Aces podcast, however you like to take in your podcast, whether that's iTunes or we're on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. You can find us pretty much anywhere podcasts are being aired. Also, if you are interested in sponsoring one or more episodes of the Parenting Aces podcast, we'd love to have you on board. You can contact me at lisa at parentingaces.com for more information or the link to our sponsorship proposal is in the show. So be sure and check out those notes. As always, we'll have links to any websites mentioned, any books mentioned, any articles mentioned. All of that can be found in the show notes. So please be sure and check those out as well. And, of course, we'd love it if you'd share our little podcast with your tennis community. So be sure and tell your friends about us. And that's it for this week's episode. We look forward to catching you next time on Parenting Aces. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, visit us online at parentingaces.com. As always, a huge thank you to our sponsor, tennisballs.com.